distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to welcome the many people who've travelled from interstate to be with us today, especially six of the eight state and territory winners of the Australian of the Year Awards. Welcome also to Ben Robert Smith, Chairman of the National Australia Day Council, to Jeremy Lasick, the CEO of the Council, to our old friend Paul House, a Nambri elder, and our Aslan interpreter, Amanda Delacy. Thank you. Also acknowledge the former Chief Minister of the ACT, Mr John Stanhope, who is uh, in the crowd, I see him there, in the crowd with us today, and his wife, Robin. Uh, my name's Matthew Trinker, for those who don't know me. I'm the Director of the National Museum of Australia, and we begin, as we always do here at the museum, by acknowledging and paying respects to the Ngambri and Ngunnawal traditional owners of the land on which we meet and honour their elders past and present. So it's my great pleasure to introduce Mr Paul Howes of the Ngambri people of Canberra to welcome us to country. Paul. Thank you, Matthew. In our local language of the Ngambri Wogaloo, I say, Nyaran Marang, good morning. Yilangalangbu, Gibabangu, Wugabu, Migabu, Diranil Bang Mayini. Ladies and gentlemen, young men and young women, distinguished guests. Nyari Injimali, Nyamri Gumal, Wogalu, Wallabaloa, Nanawu. Mujigang, Yanningbu, Jandu. My respects to Nyamri Gumal, Wogalu, Nanawu, Wallabaloa, elders past and present. Nyari Injimarabu, Mujigangu, Nurumbanji Gulbu, Ninya Yiradu. My respects also to all elders from other nations here today. Firstly, I'd like to acknowledge our ancestors uh, for laying such a strong foundation for the younger generation to move forward. People like Ali Nyonga from Wirriwa, Lake George Junamingo, here from Canberra Plains, Kangaroo Tommy, many of our ancestors well documented uh, throughout, throughout the ethno-historical records. My name is Paul House, I'm a Canberra Walgaloo man. I was born here at the centre of my ancestral country. I wasn't born here in the NMA, I was born next door in the maternity ward. <laughs> the name Canberra is derived from the name of our ancestral group and people, the Nyambri, and was gazetted as Canberra Station right here at Acton Peninsula in 1834. And when the European ancestors arrived on the horizon here in the Canberra region, they asked our ancestors, what do you call this place? And our ancestors didn't say the barbecue area. The, the, different, the different renditions of Nyambri or Canberra came back. So our country extends north to the junction of the Murrumbidgee and the Yass Rivers. West it includes the Gondawara, the Brindabella Mountains, south to Yayak, back up along the Murrumbidgee River, the south of Tuggeranong and the Queanbeyan. Queanbeyan, by the way, in Wogaloo means beautiful lady. And it, there's plenty here today, and my mother is one of them. Unfortunately, she's not here today. But also, and out to Wirriwa, all the modern day ACT, Wirriwa, Lake George, places like Yuri Yarra, uh, the Molongolo River running through Canberra, the Gudra Digby and the Gudra Gandra Rivers, all our country, and also acknowledge our multiple Aboriginal ancestries, including uh, our Wiradjuri, Pajong, Gundangara uh, people. And this welcome the country is made in the spirit of peace and a desire for harmony for all peoples of the modern ACT and surrounds. And our main aim is to establish an atmosphere of mutual respect through the acknowledgement of our ancestors and the recognition of our rights to declare our provenance in the pre and post history of our country. Our country, Walgaloo, consisted of two, uh, two sections, Eagle Hawk, uh, the Mullian, the eagle, and also the Yukonbuk, the Umbay, the crow. And they were the two sections of our groups. And the eagle man was led by, our eagle clan, the Mullian, was led by Kanu. And our crow clan, the crow people, were led by Waku. And our ancestors inherited our totems uh, and had a special bond with the land. And it was the, the two, the totem and the special bond with the land, which was able for us to look after the land for so long. 
We continue to respect our obligations to protect and conserve our culture and heritage and care for our ancestral country. And ed evidence of our occupation can be seen everywhere throughout the country. Science and research has confirmed Australian Aboriginal culture is the oldest living culture in the world. Our signature is in the land, not just our DNA. And it's places, cultural places like the NMA and landscapes like the NMA that house these stories. And the protection of these places is key uh, to the long-term survival of our stories and country. Finally, in conclusion, uh, I'd like to say the law of the land, speak about the law of the land, we must respect the law of the country. And the law of the land says the following things you must respect and honour all people in all parts of the country. Be polite, be gentle and patient with all. Respect everything living and growing. Please look after the rivers and the lands, and the land and the rivers will look after you. Yalanga, welcome. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. I'm delighted to be introducing today's event, not least because it seems fitting that we're here in this place that's committed to bringing the stories of Australians to life. And it's here that today we're reflecting on the inspiring contributions of fellow Australians to the life of the nation. This is the inaugural collaboration between the museum and the National Australia Day Council. And it goes to the heart of the stories of eight extraordinary individuals honoured as the State and Territory recipients of the 2015 Australian of the Year Awards. We also acknowledge the achievements of the State and Territory winners in other categories of the awards, the Senior Australian of the Year, Junior Australian of the Year and Australia's Local Hero, and you can see the faces of those winners on uh, the panel behind you. This year, each of the eight state and territory winners in the Australian of the Year category have chosen an object with which they have a deep personal connection. Now, not only have they been prepared to lend us this object for public exhibition, but they've also shared their varied and remarkable stories with us. Now, I know I speak for everyone at the museum, when I say this, that all of us who've been involved in this project feel that it's been a humbling and moving experience to learn about the lives of these Australians and to share some of their experiences. We thank them for being prepared to open up their lives to public view in this way, and particularly at short notice. This has all happened within the last uh, six weeks or so since uh, you were named as uh, winners. As a museum, we believe that objects often speak louder than words. Objects have a unique quality, an almost visceral power that helps us feel stories with our hearts as we come to understand them with our minds. It's an honour really to present these objects and personal stories to you and to provide a temporary home for these cherished things which means so much to our eight award winners. And I think it's important for us all to reflect upon and celebrate the very great good in our community, never more so than in this week, when we've seen barely imaginable events unfold with such tragic consequences. We hope this modest exhibition gives all Australians greater insight into the lives and achievements of others, of these remarkable people, whose commitment to doing the very best they can in each of their endeavours really serves as a model for us all. Now, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Mr. Ben Robert Smith, who's today performing what I think is your first official engagement for the National Australia Day Council as chairman. I think we all know that Ben has served with distinction in the Australian Army and the Special Air Service Regiment. He's a recipient of the Victoria Cross for Australia, the highest award in the Australian military honours system, awarded to him in 2011. But he's also been awarded the Medal for Gallantry in 2006 and the Commendation for Distinguished Service in 2013. He is then the Commonwealth's most highly decorated serviceman from the war in Afghanistan. 
Now, since retiring from the armed forces, Ben's been a leading strategic advisor to government and industry on a broad range of defence, security and personnel issues. He's Deputy Chair of the Prime Minister's Advisory Council for Veterans Mental Health and a member of the Queensland Veterans Advisory Council. And his contributions to Australia go beyond military service and those uh, advisory uh, councils. He's also patron of the White Cloud Foundation, which assists sufferers of depression and wandering warriors who support current uh, ex and ex-servicemen. Um, He's also National Ambassador for Legacy. I don't know where he finds the time. Please join me in welcoming Mr Ben Robert-Smith to the stage. Well, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Uh, welcome to our distinguished guests, uh, particularly uh, Matt Trincer, the Director of the National Museum of Australia, uh, and particularly our honoured guest, the Australian of the Year finalist for 2015. I'd also like to uh, thank Paul House for his welcome to country, uh, and I too would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of this special part of Australia and pay my respect to their elders past and present. My sincere thanks goes to Matt and his team at the National Museum of Australia for hosting us today. So thank you, Matt. As was said, today is my first official engagement as the Chair of the National Australia Day Council, and I'm honoured by this new role, and I'm looking forward
Uh, thank you very much, Matt. It's great to be here, and could I also acknowledge the traditional owners and pay my respects to <coughs> Elders past and present. Paul, thank you for your very warm and, and generous welcome, as always. The Australian of the Year Awards celebrate great Australians and tell their remarkable stories. The awards reflect our nation's history and its journey through these remarkable individuals. The year Fred Hollows was named Australian of the Year, he shared the stage with a shy 17-year-old athlete who was named the Young Australian of the Year back in 1990. Seven years later, the then 24-year-old Cathy Freeman would be presented with the Australian of the Year Award, and she remains the only person to receive both accolades. At her presentation, Cathy cited Fred Hollows as a particular hero of hers because he had challenged her to live a more selfless and dynamic life. And one of the many joys of the Australian of the Year Awards is that not only do our national finalists inspire the nation, they also inspire each other to reach even greater heights. It's wonderful today to be celebrating the Australian of the Year Awards with six of our eight finalists and uh, we'll get an opportunity now to meet and hear from each one of them. Could I welcome to the microphone first Hetty Johnson from Queensland. Well, Hetty, uh, if my maths is right, it's 17 years since you founded Bravehearts, uh, and a, a remarkable organisation that's there for kids, to support kids and kids uh, in great need. Uh, you've made tremendous progress over the 17 years, but the job is sadly ongoing. It is ongoing, but it's, um, I guess it's been a journey from silence to speaking about it, and we're a nation now who are well and truly able to speak about it and are speaking about it in, in more and more numbers. And sexual assault is actually preventable. Child sexual assault is preventable for the most part, so it really is about changing the culture and changing the think and, uh, and what we do every day to make sure that we're all participating in keeping kids safe, because we can do it. Uh, we can be the safest place in the world to raise a child, and we will be, while my feet touch the floor, by 2020. So, it, because it's possible, we've done the research, we know how to make it happen, and yeah, we're a whole bunch of us very determined to make it happen. And we all thank you for that. Um, your special object, it comes from another part of the world. In fact, I think it's the, the most travelled object <laughs> in terms of distance. Uh, it's from North America. Can you tell us about the object and why it is special sure. to you? Um, well, when we first started Brave Hearts, we started White Balloon Day, which was about breaking the silence on child sexual assault. It was wonderful. Um, people were breaking the silence, but there was no counselling for them. There was nowhere for the children to go. So um, a very dear friend became a very dear friend. Cheryl Keyes was her name, was a therapist, and she came to us and offered her help voluntarily and also brought others with her, um, psychologists and whatnot, who would all donate half a day, a day or whatever they could to help us meet this amazing demand that was back then. And, um, and she passed away, sadly, um, a number of years ago. And she, she went, before that, she went to America. She brought this talking stick back. And it is a talking stick. It is permission to speak. And she, she always looked at it as though it was, it was, you know, she was out there doing, fighting the good fight to protect children. And so when she passed away, um, she had her husband give it to me. So it's very dear to me. And I will, I will hold it dear until such time as I pass it on to somebody else. Fantastic. Ladies and gentlemen, Hetty Johnston from Queensland. Ladies and gentlemen, unfortunately our Northern Territory finalist, Rosalie Kunath-Monks, couldn't be here today. She's unwell. She sends her apologies. Her special object is a beautifully painted coolerman and clapsticks, and that's her special object as part of this exhibition. Uh, Rosalie, I'm sure, will be well and will join us uh, in j late January for the Australian of the Year presentation. For more than two decades, Rodney Croom has been a champion of lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and intersex rights. And here's the Tasmanian Australian of the Year for 2015. Rodney, please come to the microphone. We've, uh... We have come a long way since uh, you started the struggle and, uh, and have been involved in the struggle, but uh, uh, you've made great gains, uh, both in Tasmania and for the nation. Uh, um, how do you view the journey of the last 20 plus years? Um. Jeremy uh, and everyone, thanks for coming along today. Uh, obviously, it's been a difficult journey at times. Um, it's always difficult when uh, there is prejudice and discrimination um, and you seek to challenge that. 
Uh, I've always tried to do that in a way which uh, is patient uh, and which uh, brings people together because prejudice can divide and to overcome it we need to see what we have in common. Um, and in the last 20 years we have, as you say, come a long way. Uh, when I first came out in Tasmania in the late 80s, uh, I was in a relationship with another man that was against, it was against the law. Um, and I think today most Australians look back at that and think that was ridiculous and how uh, good it is that our nation has moved on. Um, and uh, I hope that remaining discrimination in areas like marriage, etc., uh, in a few years' time, when we're over that, we'll look back and think, what were we thinking then too? Um, social progress is something I have great faith in. I have great faith that uh, our fellow Australians are good-hearted and generous people and that uh, when we point out the damage that prejudice does, we can move on from it. Your object uh, it relates to the struggle and uh, goes way back, I think, to the 1980s. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Um, yes. Uh, I. Uh, not long after I came out, um, we had a little stall at Salamanca Market in Hobart. And, um, some officials didn't like us being there and so the store was banned and we thought that was unfair so we set it up again and the police came in um, and I was wearing the badge that I've uh, put in the exhibition on the, the first time I was arrested um, and it's important to me not only because it's a symbol to me of standing up for something you believe in but also because it represents the fundamental reason that I do what I do and that is the desire to belong. Uh, the badge has a little pink triangle, which is a symbol of, of the gay rights movement around the world, and a little Tasmania, um, which are sort of similar shapes, and they're coming together. Um, and that represents to me the coming together of two fundamental aspects of who I am, as a gay man and, a, and as someone who is a proud Tasmanian. Um, there is nothing more important in our life than finding that place where we belong and not being cut off from that. Uh, by discrimination or by inequality. So then I was driven by the desire to belong, and I still do. Um, and I hope other people take inspiration from that, that uh, we all should feel that we belong. Well, you belong here today. Please uh, thank Rodney Croon. Thank you. My great pleasure now to welcome Rosie Batty to the microphone. Rosie, Rosie is the Victorian Australian of the Year and she's shown amazing courage uh, since the death of her son Luke earlier this year. Rosie, uh, you've had to deal this year with the most awful circumstances imaginable. Um, what's, what's given you the courage to, uh, to battle on as you have and to become a voice for, uh, for people who are victims of domestic violence? <coughs> Well, I've always believed in the human spirit. I think we have immense courage within us. And when you're faced with the worst challenges possible, it's amazing where you can find that strength. <clears throat> you gain strength from family and you gain strength from friends. And this amazing journey I've been on since Luke's death, <clears throat> I have been given the greatest kindness and support from everyone. <clears throat> and it's been far-reaching. I still get cards. Sorry, <clears throat> I still get cards. I still get gifts. I still get a lot of kindness being shown to me. And I've always believed that, just like what's happening in Sydney at the moment, when there's great tragedy, there is enormous community goodwill, and that's what makes us human, and that's what gives us a sense of connectivity, belonging. There's so much badness in the world, but there is so much more good. And we all have it within us to be better people and make the world a better place. And I'm really humbled to be here today with these wonderful people. Um, and to see my little doll. Well, let's um, ha mm. have a sip of water. Thank you. <laughs> um, it's, a, it's a special object. Uh, it's a, it is a little doll. Um, What's the story behind that doll? Well, for some reason, all my dolls ended up without any clothes. I um, don't know where they went. I'm sure they came in clothing. But she was a really beautiful little pretty doll with long blonde hair. 
possibly something I would might like to have had blonde hair. But she was given to me my, by my godmother when I was very little, and it was soon after my mum died, because my mother died when I was six. So she was a real comfort to me. And over the years, I asked my grandmother, Nana Atkin, if she would knit me some clothes for my doll so that I could keep her forever and treasure her and have something that my grandma had made for me. So she would be extremely um, thrilled to know that she's here um, in spirit and there's a lovely picture of her. She lived till she was 100 and she was the most inspiring woman with a great sense of family. She was still the very centre of the family, loved by everybody. And she lived long enough to see Luke when he was six months old and she died two months later. Ladies and gentlemen, Rosie Batty. Thanks, Rosie. Travelling the furthest to join us today is Lynn Beasley, the West Australian Australian of the Year. Lynn uh, is uh, a former chief scientist in the West, a great champion of science. And, uh, as, and when she received the award, I should say, it was pointed out by the MC on that occasion, has the best smile in the world, <laughs> not, just, not just in the West. Uh, Lynn, it's great that you're here today. You're a, you're a great champion of science, and particularly for young Australians. Um, how's that battle going for you in terms of turning people on to, to science? Because I must admit, I was more of an English history type guy, a science I struggled with. So how are we doing in 2014, getting kids activated into science? I think every young person is curious about the world around them. And that means science and art put together the way it is in this wonderful museum and museums across the country and across the world. But you must have asked as a young person, what's the moon doing up there? Why is grass green? And we just have to make sure we keep that enthusiasm and that spirit alive so that every Australian, I think, has the chance of the best education, science being amongst that. And it's going to make us an even smarter country. And that means a better future for us economically, socially, environmentally, and importantly, culturally. Lynn, your special object is, uh, is quite beautiful, as are all the, all the objects. Uh, tell us about your crab brooch and the, is it an oyster shell? It is indeed. Well, thank you for saying they're beautiful. I think they are too. I chose them because I'd spent a lot of my life studying how to protect the developing brain and to fix it up after injury. And in fact, I was fortunate enough to do research that actually helped ensure the health of one of my uh, granddaughters when she was born prematurely, which was very special for me. But I could apply that information, that knowledge too, to help the pearling industry to design better pearls. So that's why the brooch is there. But the brooch is a crab, and the little tiny crab lives inside a pearl oyster, hence the pearl oyster shell. It's being carved by an Aboriginal man from the Kimberley, Bruce Wigan, and I wanted to acknowledge the art and science of the first Australians, so that's why that is there. The two creatures only work if they're together. So it's part of that sort of community in which we all live. It's understanding our environment better, whether it's the marine environment or terrestrial, to protect it. But it's also discovering so that we can protect our environment as we develop, for example, the resources sector for our oil and gas industry off the uh, northwest shelf. So for me, science is part of the community. We want to be smarter even than we are now as Australians for a better future. I want to make sure that I do my bit, just my little bit, towards giving everyone, particularly young Australians, the best chance in life, and that includes it is a great education and science will be part of it. So that's why I chose the objects. Ladies and gentlemen, Lynn Beasley. Now, unfortunately, the New South Wales Australian of the Year, who is Deborah Lee Furness this year, uh, a leading advocate for uh, adoption, isn't able to be with us. But I'm hoping with the, the wonders of modern science, we may have a message that uh, Deborah's gotten to us in the last uh, few hours. I'm so sorry I can't be with all you awesome people that are doing amazing things, but I just wanted to introduce 
uh, my part of the exhibition, which is representative of how my journey started when my then five-year-old son would watch the World Vision ads on a Saturday morning instead of cartoons and w and could see what was happening in the world. Then one day I, I'm sitting there and he walks across the, the living room with his wagon full of bottled water and I said, Oscar, what are you doing? You took that out of the fridge. And he goes, Mum, I'm on my way to Africa because they've got dirty water. And I sat there, I thought, if my five-year-old is willing to set up and do something great for the world, I've really got to do something too. So that's how my journey began. Deborah Lee Finesse. And, uh... As with Rosalie from the Northern Territory, Deborah Lee will be with us in January for the, uh, the presentation uh, on the lawns of Parliament House. Now, uh, being the hometown boy, I guess Glenn Keyes, if you'd like to come forward. Glenn has the home ground advantage. <laughs> uh, Glenn, I'm sure most of you know, is the ACT Australian of the Year. Uh, he's running an amazing business. Uh, his business, Aspen Medical, is there on the front line with the, uh, the tackling the Ebola virus, and, uh, and that's remarkable. But Glenn, um, as important as that is, not only to you, your business, but also to the world, um, you've got, I think, a bigger fish to fry in terms of uh, back here in Australia and doing remarkable things for people with disabilities. Yeah, thank you. It's, uh, it, it's certainly something that's been a big part of my life now for, uh, you know, since our son Aaron was born, we've been heavily involved in, uh, in disability support and services and, and that's led us from being initially involved with the Down Syndrome Association um, and then through things like Special Olympics um, and then uh, Project Independence, which are quite a unique housing option for people with an intellectual disability and now through to the, the NDIS. And uh, it, it's tremendous work. And again, as with all the finalists, um, you're making remarkable progress. Now, you're, I don't know if you're a romantic at heart, Glenn, but um, uh, it's something, your object's something related to your marriage, your wedding, uh, but also clearly to your family. It, it is. Family's a, a, an incredibly strong aspect of my life, my family, my parents, my grandparents, but particularly now my close family. And I was trying to find something that would represent a number of aspects, uh, family being one of them. And so it's a candle that was uh, made for my wife and I when we were married. But I really wanted something that would bring in uh, our children as well. And uh, on the back of the candle is the names of each of the children and the day they were baptised. And we lit the candle at their baptism as well. But part of what I wanted to bring was that I think my business, which you spoke about, has given me the wherewithal to be able to pursue some of these activities. And I'm a big believer that business is a part of community and has to give back. And you could do that from the smallest entity. And so um, one thing that I did is I've been doing lots of businesses since I was a kid. And my very first business was making and selling candles. And so I thought the idea of uh, uh, the candle sort of brought in the business aspect as well as uh, that, that very close family aspect as well. Ladies and gentlemen, he arrived back from Dubai this morning specifically to be here. Glenn, great to see you and thank you for being here. Thanks, Glenn. And I know our team at the National Australia Day Council, since the idea of this exhibition was, uh, was created, and we really do value this collaboration, this amazing collaboration with the museum, we've had a little think as individuals about if we happened to be sitting here, what would our special object be? And I'd just perhaps take a moment to reflect what would, in your life, be the special object that you'd see in a case, maybe not at the National Museum, but um, if you had to pick something out, what might it be? Um, I think it's worth reflecting. Finally, Jill Hicks from South Australia, our South Australian Australian of the Year. Please welcome Jill. Like all our finalists, Jill's got a, a, an amazing, a remarkable story. Jill was uh, caught up in the 2005 London bombings. She was uh, the last person pulled out alive from, uh, from that awful scene. And, uh, Jill, I guess if we reflect on the events of the last 48, 72 hours uh, here in Australia and obviously overseas more recently, uh, your message for peace is as uh, important now as it's ever been. Absolutely. Um, for me, there was an, an absolute vow and recognition that if I was to survive, then I must 
devote my life to making a difference. And I didn't know what that difference would be. Um, so I created an organisation just called MAD. And I thought, actually, I quite like this because it could be mad crazy, it could be mad angry, but equally, it could just be a fantastic acronym for making a difference. And... Um, as the years unfolded, it became very clear to me that the difference I needed to make was to, I think, be a, a symbolic idea of a bridge that can go between division in society. So that's how I started my journey. And then um, more recently, it's been really looking at extremism within our societies and um, how to create very particular communication to counter the very destructive narratives um, that are coming through and that are susceptible to so many of our young people. You've been pushing out a message about peace. Um, what's your message today, given? That peace is a verb. So if we thought about it as something that wasn't just an ideal of something we could all strive for, this idea of utopia, but if we thought about peace as a verb and something that we all consciously did, then it changes the whole face immediately. So, You're, uh, You've got a remarkable special object. Mm. Um, it was with you in London at that time. Tell us about it. Um, I've seen it. This is the third time I've seen my object, and it's my briefcase I had with me in the carriage at the time of the bombings. And um, I've only ever opened it briefly and then closed it back up again. And I remember when the forensic team brought it back to me and I said, I don't want it cleaned, I want it preserved so I will never forget that moment. And for me, it's the, it's the symbol of the end of life as I knew it, the end of what I call life number one. And there are some particular objects in there that I'm not proud of, uh, one of which is a cigar case that clearly says smoking kills. Um, uh, and I am no longer a smoker. But there, it's, a, it's a great reminder of I was devoted very much to my career um, rather than looking at really how I could make a, di a difference as a person. So that's the demarcation line for me of life number one compared to life number two. Thank you for providing it. And would you thank Jill Hicks? Yeah, thank you. Thanks, So as Matt said at the outset, this is a first uh, in terms of a collaboration. It's certainly the first time we've had an opportunity to bring together the, uh, the finalists for the Australian of the Year Awards uh, more than a month before the presentation. They will be back in Canberra uh, for the presentation on the 25th of January. We're so looking forward to that. Would you thank our six finalists and Deborah and Rosalie, please. I'll, uh, I'll hand back now to, to Matt Trinker. Thank you very much. Can I add my thanks uh, to uh, the six of you who joined us here today and to the other two who couldn't make it? You know, through you know, my own um, personal career, I've been driven by the, the notion that um, story and that people's stories are are of inestimable value, that if we cherish our stories as a nation, then it makes us bigger. And today, I can honestly say that it, it, I feel as if it was, for me, a proof of concept, listening to the six of you relate aspects of your personal stories and, um, and also explaining those through this, um, this sort of remarkable um, frame that we place before you, the idea of a single object to explain something about yourself. Thank you for what I felt was a very affecting and um, a graceful uh, sense that you brought to telling us about your stories. Ladies and gentlemen, that really concludes today's official proceedings. But before we close, I do want to thank a few other people. I, I want to thank uh, uh, Mr. Ben Robert Smith, the Chairman of the National Australia Day Council, the CEO of the Council, Jeremy Lasick, uh, and all their terrific staff who've worked so hard to make uh, this project come to life. Not the least, I think, Caroline Ludovici, Ludovici, I hope I got that right, 
and, uh, and her team uh, at the Council. Uh, I'd also like to thank uh, some members of uh, the staff here at the National Museum of Australia, immensely hard-working staff, who had an incredibly busy year this year, but they didn't flinch when their director asked them to make an exhibition in a month. Um, they might be flinching now, but they didn't at the time. Uh, to uh, Serena Milne, uh, Po Sung, uh, Patrick Baum, uh, Tanya Riviere, Therese Osborne, Judith Hickson in particular, but also to uh, the staff more generally in exhibitions, registration, curatorial events, media services and our media manager, I say thank you uh, very much. Um, thank you all for attending. Uh, I hope you have a great Christmas. It's only a week away. We promise there won't be another opening at the National Museum between now and then. Uh, there are other things to celebrate, uh, but I do hope that you have a great Christmas and uh, stay safe on the roads if you're travelling over the holiday period. I'd also just now invite you to view the, the, uh, the objects, the exhibits on display in the hall and join us for a light lunch uh, over there in the bay window that's behind you and, uh, and share, we hope, in a glass, a celebratory glass of bubbly supplied by our great friends uh, here at the museum, Canberra's local multi-award winning uh, vineyard Capital Wines. Thank you all. <laughs>